Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to an inaugural podcast with the Serving Those Who Serve team. Today, we have the Grand Puba, the founder of Serving Those Who Serve, Dan <laughs> Seip. He is going to uh, walk us through a little bit about who he is and and also then talk a little bit about the history of Serving Those Who Serve specifically. So, Dan, uh, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Now that I'm a poobah. <laughs> hey, you know what? I just gave you a promotion there, my friend. All right. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start with your history in financial services. Tell us why you, desar- you decided to go into financial services, please. Well, first off, I got to throw one thing in here, Matt, and that is when whenever I have this opportunity, I want to say thank you to all the civilian feds because they're the glue that holds all this together. And we thank everybody else in the world, but we forget to thank them. So I always like to remember to do that. All you civilian federal employees out there, you know we love you here at Serving Those Who Serve, but just want to, on behalf of all of us, say thank you. So I'm sorry, what was the question? Why why did you decide to work in the financial services industry? Okay. I was kind of pulled into it in the sense that I was a child of the 50s, which means I graduated in the 70s, and it was an economic period very much like what we had after 08. So it was a depressed period. There were no jobs. Came out school and you said, here I am. And the world said, who cares? Now, my father had a very warm view of the world, which was if you don't work, you don't eat. So I was going to be employed. And a large number of us from that era were actually underemployed. And that's sort of where I was. I'd always worked. I worked all through college. Uh, I worked for a refuse company to uh, pay my way through school because I learned that if you had a robust constitution and you weren't afraid of doing a long day's work, you could make a little more money. So that resonated with me. And so I gravitated into where I was working for a landscape company. And I was doing landscape work for someone in this industry and had conversations with him. He took a shine to me. And I don't want to say that I was shanghaied because there was no rum involved. But what I really thought I was doing was I thought I was asking him for help with my finances because I was newly married. I was making a little money. He was in that industry. It made sense to me to ask him. And he said, OK, uh, you need to come to the office. So I thought, all right, I guess that makes sense. You go to the office. And then I got to the office and he said, I need you to talk to the manager. And I went, okay, I guess we'll talk to the manager. Wow, there's a lot of steps to this getting help with your money stuff. And then the manager said, we want you to take a test. And that threw me a little bit of a curve because like, oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll take the test. And the next thing you knew, I sort of woke up on the deck of a ship singing God Save the Queen. Was that too obscure? because I sometimes do that, but there was no rum involved. I want to stress <laughs> that. But, but it was really funny because I'm such an idealist sometimes that here I was, I wanted help with my planning. I wanted to learn stuff. I wanted to do better. And they say, take a test, meet the manager. I'm going, sure, I'll do that. And let me set the scene for you. If you can imagine a young man with the enthusiasm of a golden retriever hmm. bouncing around, it's like, we need you to take a test. Okay, I'll take a test. We need you to meet the manager. Great. I'll meet the manager. Can't wait for them to tell me smart stuff to do with my money. And next thing I knew, they were talking to me about coming into the financial industry. And that brought me, in a sense, to here. Now, you started off the podcast by talking about uh, thanking the civilian government employees. So I'm assuming that's going to answer the next question, which is who do you work with and what's your specialty? Well, that's our mission as as much as anything else. And specifically, it's individuals who have serving, chosen to serve the public trust through civilian federal service. They serve you and me, Matt. I mean, that's the reality. And we need to remember, we started this year with the shutdown. Mm-hmm. And there were a whole lot of people hurt by that. And I've got a problem with that. You don't hurt the people that are serving you. So on the off chance they may be listening, executive branch – Legislative branch, read my lips. 
no more shutdowns. Hmm. Please don't hurt the people that are serving. But I digress. So we're here in the District of Columbia. So there are a lot of career feds. And that is our core mission to reach, teach and serve them. How do you help them, though? So you're you're reaching them, you're teaching them and serving them. What does the serve look like? What do you do for them exactly? Well, I guess it might help to take a step back and talk about why. Uh, Ooh, I like it. why. Yeah, go for <laughs> okay. why. That's a great okay. idea. What's 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 my why? Uh, folks, in full disclosure, Matt and I have known each other for a while. So uh, we <laughs> this banter is actually pretty normal. Uh, how how long are we now, Matt? I don't know, 10 years, I think. We're, we're, yeah, we're approaching yeah. so 10 years, yeah. We're measuring in decades now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yep. So I came to doing this because of my father-in-law. He died suddenly, and I hadn't been married for very long, and he was a retired federal employee. He worked for General Services Administration, and he was an auditor. So I'm fond of saying that serving those who serve was born on August 2nd, 1988, when he died suddenly. I had married into a family of four children, and five heads turned towards me. It wasn't long after I had met the gentleman who brought me into the industry, and I just wanted to dig in and help. Uh, this was pre-internet days, so I requested manuals, which are really big, thick books, and I read through them to the best of my ability to help be able to guide my mother-in-law through the process of claiming his federal retirement benefits, federal insurance benefits, and it was in that process that I got one of the jolts of my life, and that was, he, he was really, really, really bright and very, very gifted. But for whatever reason, he just missed a few things about his benefits that really, really mattered. Mm -hmm. he, he probably would have gotten a B on a quiz. But the numbers he told my mother-in-law to expect and what she got were very different and not in a good way. So this was the tough part. I got to explain it to her, but I couldn't fix it. Mm. So needless to say, that really shook me. But it was also a call as I look back on it, because I told my wife then that when I finished getting mom sorted out as best I could, I wanted to go to work for a place that helped feds like dad. And I tried, but in 1988, I couldn't find one. So I just started explaining how federal benefits work to any fed I met. And 30 years later, that's how we got here. Let's talk about ideal clients. So the, the goal of you guys podcasting is to get your thought leadership in front of the right people. Who do you want to work with? Well, it's a career fed, Matt. And as I said, serving those to serve has a core mission to reach, teach and serve feds. And that links directly back to the fact that I felt guilty about not being able to help my own in-laws. But what I thought through that is, you know, if, if I just gotten into the industry five years earlier, if I had learned stuff like this earlier, I could have brought it to his attention. I could have headed this off. Well, in all fairness, that problem wasn't the fault of the program. And by that, I mean the federal benefits program. It's just that when you have this large group of people working for a super employer whose primary sensory input is visual. So back then it was paper. Now it's now it's digital. So if my father-in-law got got multiple pieces of paper in the same day and four had to do with his job and one had to do with his benefits, I know which one he meant to read and I know which one he did because he got back to doing the job. Mm -hmm. So what was driven home to me from that is somebody needs to take the time to read the stuff they don't have time to read. So our ideal client or the ideal person for us to meet because we do work for a whole lot of people that don't end up choosing to work with. It's a career fed. It's a career fed who really wants to understand the benefits they have and learn how to make the most of them as they relate to their financial lives. How, how, I, oh God, I'm keep going. No, Sorry go about that. No, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering how, how, how you, so it's reach teach. And what was the last one? Serve. Serve. So how do on, you reach them? The hey, you know what? I, I'm, I'm <laughs> so that's true. That's a really good point. Uh, how do you acquire these people? So how do you reach them? Well, they kind of find us because we uh, this past year, we ran 70 free seminars that are pure education because what we want to do 
if you are out there and you're a Fed and you want to get a better understanding of your benefits and you want it in a no pressure situation where it's clear, we like to say it's understanding made easy. So, so we will run these seminars throughout the year. And what's, what's really kind of funny about that is they actually came from a family experience too. And I'll touch on that in a second. But when we first started, we were completely transparent about who we are. Yes, we're a financial firm and we did not hide that. So we would have people coming to seminars and there might only be three people there because sometimes our industry deserves some of the knocks it takes. And even the ones who did attend were sort of expecting that there would be a place where we would pivot out of education and try and sell or do something like that. But we stayed true and we never did. So four years later, what we've learned, and we have people come to our seminars from a variety of sources, but hands down, the number one way is through word of mouth because we know they're going to talk to their friends about us, good or bad. So what we always tell them is if you come to the one day seminar and that answers all your questions and takes care of everything you need, that's great. Shake our hand. Best of luck to you. We just ask one thing. Tell your friends we did it right that we made sure it was about you and your benefits. But also, Matt, we build into that complimentary follow-up sessions that, again, are purely educational. And we put that in writing where we're not going to talk about anything else other than the benefits and helping them to understand it. And if that fulfills what they need, again, shake our hand. Good luck. Just tell your friends we did it right. And, of course, we have a financial firm. If somebody wants to work with us, we're thrilled. But remember, it's it, it's connected to a family thing. So I brought up the shutdown before and my colleagues made me promise I wouldn't do big rants on this. So I'm, I'm really behaving myself, <laughs> but there I am on December 22nd of this past year. And all I could think about was my father-in-law at say age 45 coming home to a family of four little kids in the house, not sure when his next paycheck is going to come at Christmas time. Mm. And and that, that's not how you treat somebody who serves the public trust. But the other part of the story, Mary's mom lived a rich, full life. At the end, she was with us, not because of finances, but because of needing care. And it was during that time that I was waxing a little bit about how what I learned from helping her dad led to my calling, serving those who serve. And she asked me a question that just stopped me right in my tracks. And she said, what happens to your feds if something happens to you? Because oh. at that point, yeah, nice. At that point, I was one guy and it was all in my head. Hmm. So I thought long and hard about that. And that was when I made the decision to see if I could enlist other people in the mission, teach the next generation, and sort of build out to be able to do more things that led us to the seminars because as i looked back on it if there was just more quality individual edu education somebody taking the time to explain how it works then things could have been very different for my father-in-law and very different for a whole lot of people so that's a roundabout way of saying they kind of find us through that process and if if somebody's coming in just looking for the education we're happy to help them there but if they do want to talk about us about our other areas of expertise, sure. You had said something to me on a previous phone call that that this training that you provide is actually mandatory. Like they're supposed to go through this training before they retire. Is that is that true? Okay. the The OPM Financial Literacy Initiative was passed a few years ago, and and the agencies are doing a bang up job. They are doing their level best to get to get enough seminars run to teach them. One of the things about our seminars is we actually use the same contractors that they use to go into the federal agencies. But I did the math and by conservative estimates, there's 400,000 career feds in the DC, Maryland and Virginia area. Many estimates show that as many as 60% of them will be eligible to retire in the next five years. Okay. That's 240,000. That means the agencies will have to run 6,000 seminars. That's over 100 a month. 
that's that's a tough job. So what really drove that home to me was the need for additional opportunities for that education. And I'd been doing it one on one. So how could we expand that? How could we get more opportunities for people to learn about this? And I think you've done a good job of, of talking about the, the client education seminar thing. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the team that you've built now that this isn't just Dan Sipe. So talk to us about uh, who else is on board here. Well, no, number one is my partner, Thomas Lee. And uh, and the first thing he brings to the table is he's a genius. And for years, I have tried to do this self-deprecating joke about I'm the partner who is unburdened by genius. And then somebody pointed out to me that people already do that, so I didn't need to say it. <laughs> so uh, as, as you well know, Matt, the big thing I can say about Tom is that you cannot exhaust him in the area of research or tax planning or strategy. Uh, he is he is absolutely the most durable man in that area that I've ever seen. And he just sees things in research that other people don't see. And additionally, his dad's a career fed. So you may want to have him on for uh, for a podcast because that story is very, very interesting and compelling. Then there's uh, there's our senior advisor, Wes Battle. He's married to a Fed. His grandfather had a long career with the VA. He's committed to the, vi the vision and the mission. And actually, I think he has one of the best names I have ever heard. Yeah. It's, it's like a G.I. Joe character, man. Yep, it's James Wesley Battle the <laughs> Fourth. I offered to trade it with him. Oh wow! <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, I said, "Hey, look, you know, can I have that name?" And he goes, "Only if I can have that seat." And I said, "Okay, well, we'll keep what we have." <laughs> um, so he'd actually be an interesting topic. And I'm not going to go through the entire roster because there's there's 22 people here now. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this: every one of our advisors is a CFP certified financial planner. They all are AIF, accredited investment fiduciaries, and they all hold the CHFEBC, Chartered Federal Employee Benefits a Consultant designation. So those are the minimum standards. And again, one of my little self-deprecating jokes is that since I'm the old guy here, I couldn't get hired in my own firm because I certainly didn't have that pedigree at yeah. 30. What what do you guys do in the community? I mean, besides the 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 educational events, I mean, how how else are you getting your name and face out there? The big thing is just through being out among the people, mm -hmm. because you know one of the things when you if if somebody chooses to work with us, you know we've got we've got blogs and we've got newsletters to uh, to keep them up on their benefits, but we've never lost sight of the fact of what I learned in the beginning, which was reading the stuff that people don't have time to read. Well, there's another component to that that I've discovered from having a large number of people that are in the mission with me. We're encountering more and more situations. So with any super employer, whether it's General Motors, IBM, or the federal government, there can always be a quirky little thing that happens in the benefits that most people may not know about. Well, when we're out there and we're working with as many people as we are, we're constantly learning. It's coming back. We have multiple training and sharing sessions per week. So when we are meeting anybody in federal service, we're in a position to really, really, really know a ton about the stuff and further to know where we can get the answers if they need it. So a lot of it is just the, the basic presence in the community. What is your financial philosophy? Uh, well, it, it comes from my genius partner, Tom, <laughs> and uh, as you might guess, it's highly academic, and it's something we've grown towards through time and experience and crashes and economic cycles. We follow the work of three Nobel laureates, Harry Markowitz, Modern Portfolio Theory, Daniel Kahneman, Behavioral Finance, and Eugene Fama's three-factor model. And anybody who has an interest in that, we're, we're happy to, uh, to go into lengthy uh, discourse explaining why we feel it makes sense. So we're not market timers. We're not going to be the people saying, hey, here's the next big thing and jump in and jump out. That's not us. If you're looking for that, we're not the people. If you're meeting with us, it's going to be data driven. It's going to be academic and it's going to be scientific. And Matt, here's the thing. The, the folks we serve, the career feds are a highly educated group. And they've told us this is a good fit for them. Hmm. 
Now we're going to switch gear and find out a little bit more about Dan Sype, the human, not Uh just the machine. (laughs) When you're not working, what do you do for fun, man? Well, as you know, Matt, I have uh, I have great kids, as do you. And they are they are really, really talented in a lot of areas. So clearly they got all that from their mom. Hmm. They both sing. Uh, as a matter of fact, my son, Colin, last year made it to the callbacks of The Voice. Oh, uh, it's very exciting. Flow to Atlanta for it. And as he put it, you know, one is one is group got all the way down to the final knockout. And then one of the girls who made onto the show, as he put it, kicked his head off. (laughs) So uh, so he uh, he had a great time with that. But in addition, they are both accomplished track and field athletes. They both throw shot put discus hammer and weight. And yes, that's right. My son and my daughter do that because people follow along and not along with me. And then all of a sudden. They make the connection. They go, wait, your daughter? And so, uh, so yeah, she, uh, she does that. So I'm sort of the crazy fan dad that's uh, waving the big school flag up in the stands. And it's, it's really been a fulfillment of a dream for me because I guess it was, it was back in the, in the 80s, early 90s, when Karch Karai – the Olympic volleyball legend was playing team volleyball. They didn't have the beach volleyball yet. And the U S had a super team and they had a chance to medal. Well, they ended up winning gold. Well, there were times they would cut to the stands and his dad, Dr. Karai was up at the top of the stands, just waving this big American flag and pumping his fist and screaming at the top of his lungs. And I said, that's who I want to be when I grow up. And uh, so it's given me the opportunity to do that. And and actually one of the biggest thrills over and above being there with the kids is that when Mary and I get there, the other athletes, because we root for everybody, go, mom, dad. So uh, so that puts a big smile on my face. And uh, and that's some of the most fun I have. Who is your hero? My dad. Yeah, definitely my dad. It came out of the Depression. And, uh, and he had a, he had a bumpy life when he was older, college age, ready to go to college. His mom developed cancer and his dad walked out. And so he had to give up a scholarship to support the family and be my grandmother's caregiver. And, uh, here's a little cool inside family fact. While my grandmother was in the hospital, she let the nurse who was caring for her know that she was going to marry my dad. And that actually happened. Hmm. Now, my mom was not too keen on the idea because she wasn't too wild about my dad, but uh, my grandmother assured her that she would indeed marry my dad, and I'm kind of proof that uh, that that happened. But because of fulfilling his obligations, he also carried this massive crushing weight through his whole life about not being educated, and yet – he was probably the most learned man I have ever met in my life. Constantly reading, constantly curious, incredibly creative and artistic. Uh, he would do things that would defy descriptions on that front. You know, for example, and maybe it's because of, of the bumpy family life he had, Christmas was a big deal. And making Christmas great, Christmas displays, Christmas decorations, Christmas music, big deal at our house. And further, he was very meticulous about things. So he always got the same kind of tree. And it was always a big fat scotch pine. And he always got it from the same guy who came out down from Clear Light, Pennsylvania to the same place in our neighborhood. So I guess I'm about nine years old and I want to show pops that I'm paying attention. So we get there. I jump out of the car and I run over and I proudly get a hold of a big fat scotch pine. I say, Dad, how about this one? And he goes, no, no, Danny. This year we're going to get skinny trees. And I thought, trees, plural? And he goes, yeah, yeah. So over, come on over here. So now we're looking for two perfectly matched skinny spruce trees. And I'm asking him, what, what are we going to do? He goes, going to make a display. I'll show you. Well, I don't know if your audience or even you, Matt, are necessarily old enough to know about something called storm window plastic. So this is before all the cool glass windows with thermopanes and things like that. So to keep the weather out, you would stretch this heavy, super clear plastic over your screens, and they became an additional way of insulation. Well, they came in huge sheets, so my dad took a bunch of this, stretched it over a big wooden frame, about seven feet by five feet, and then he used draftsman's tape and cray paper working from the back. He made a stained glass window 
of two shepherds standing on a rock looking up at the star of Bethlehem in between the two trees. Because, sure, everybody does that. <laughs> and it pains me to say I can't just bolt something to my head and project that on the screen for everybody who might be listening. But it was amazing. So, yeah, definitely him. Uh, you know, another way, he was an amazing athlete. But he never pushed me into sports. He let me find it on my own. I was never very good, but he never missed a thing. He never missed anything I did. So, yeah, definitely him. If you had all the money in the world you ever needed, what would you do? Fix stuff! <laughs> Fair. Oh, you want you want specific? I don't know. I Maybe an elaboration. Not, not too much specifics. But, yeah, I mean, I'd like for you to dig a little deeper in that. Well, I'll tell you one thing. There'd never be another shutdown. <laughs> I'd, I, and I'd make sure the contractors got paid too. Yeah. Okay. But seriously, I believe you can't see the challenges in the world. You're not looking outward. You know, I'm a big believer in the fact that you need to look around and realize the amazing gifts you've been given. See, and this still goes back to, to my relationship with my wife and her family. One of those four children was special needs. And so Rita lives with us now. Marries her guardian. And interestingly enough, uh, she is under a wonderful provision of the great CSRS, Civil Service uh, Retirement System, where she has a disabled survivor's annuity that gives her a little bit of money and covers her health insurance. But here's the here's again the tie into the mission because that's a great benefit for her. And it has been shut off not once but twice at the death of each parent. So the first time it happened when dad passed away because she was over the age that she should still be on the health insurance plan. So it's like, oh, we caught this and cut her off. So we were able to get the documentation to show that she had been disabled since birth. And so she was put back in and the annuity started. So when it became clear that mom was going to pass, I remember saying to Mary, don't worry about it because we're now 20 years in serving those who serve exists. I've got people. I've got a team. I said, you know, don't don't worry. We've got things that we can do. And sure enough, we put together a great package. We dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and it gets turned off again. So that was a great humbling experience for me. But it just goes to show you that, again, with any super employer, you can get these funny little quirks that you need to know what to do. Both times we were able to get it, be able to get it turned back on. But the big thing I've learned from my relationship with Rita is if you are born with a level playing field, you need to think you've already been given a lot. So I guess that's why I'm looking for places where I'd want to make a difference. I'm not a car guy. I'm not a bobble guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking anybody who is. But if I, if I had control of all the money in the world, I'd do what I could to make things better. Who was your favorite person in history? Inherit this one from my dad. He was a big fan of Thomas Jefferson. And, and my dad was, he was always passing, you know, history things to me. And in his youth, he was a golden glove boxer. So I remember he'd say, you know, Joe Lewis could beat any of the fighters today. And I remember him saying that, uh, that he thought Thomas Jefferson could still do the job that could still be a great precedent. And the more I read about him and visited Monticello and, and learned more about just all the gifts the guy had, yeah, I think he's probably my favorite. What is your idea of success and how, how do you define that word? Boy, I wish my, I wish my kids were here because, uh, one of the things that, that I would say is part of succeeding is, is not failing and within their definition as, as I've tried to teach them and they can just fire it back from the hip. And I'll ask my son, I'll say, when, when do you, when do you fail? He goes, when I stop trying. Mm. So I think if you're, if you're focused on trying to work th towards worthwhile things and you're making progress, even if it's just 1%, then, then that's success. And it's, it's a great life and it's a great way to move forward, trying to do the best with what God gave you. Name one thing that you recommend most to your clients, family, or friends. Ooh, see, I'm a big mouth, so I talk about a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, probably books. I, I do read a lot, and, uh, 
And but I also like movies, but it's probably about a five to one ratio for books. Uh, can I plug one? Absolutely. Now right that's awesome. It's Rocket Men, and it's talking about Apollo Eight. And now everybody's going through. I'm like, which 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 one's Apollo Eight? It's it's just amazing. There was this critical moment in in Apollo's evolution where they were tackling the most experimental thing they had ever done because they were trying to accelerate to keep pace with President Kennedy's goal of reaching the moon and returning by the end of the decade. So if you get into it, I mean, it, it's it's a page turner. It's great on Audible. I have both. And even though I lived through it, even though I remember the Christmas Eve and Christmas Day television show uh, television shows from from that, it it it's just amazing the 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 people that were involved in this and and I I can't I can't recommend it enough. It's it's fantastic. And the one thing that jumped out, it was occurring at a time of great division and discord. Hmm. So it was really kind of interesting to hear that in our current space. Yeah. All right. Name one thing that most people don't know about you. I worry a lot and I wish I didn't. Hmm. Uh, I, I think sometimes you just have hard wiring that makes you want to be sure that things will work out. And I think that's why I probably gravitated towards a planning role because there are so many variables out there that – I try and anticipate a lot of them. I try and have have good systems and processes in 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 my life and in in my work. And sometimes people get the misconception that I'm a guy who doesn't worry much. And it's like, eh, no, no, not so much. <laughs> All right. Do you have a mantra or or a motto or something that you say to keep yourself focused when you are off track and you like want to recenter? Well, again, from from doing all the reading and 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 all the listening and the audiobooks and things like that, I've I've, I've sometimes feel like I have a million of them flying around in my head. But I think uh, I think the one that keeps coming back to me is Churchill. You know, never give up, never never give up. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Proudest achievement. Let's wrap this up today with what do you hmm. think is that proudest achievement? I think I might shy away from calling it achievement, but there there is an experience that I was blessed to have in my career that kind of brought everything full circle because since I was the Fed guy and this was in a way a little bit pre-serving those who serve, becoming what it is with so many people. I mean, the name has been around since the 80s and and I did individual work under that, but as far as being being the organization that it is today. So I was the Fed guy. We have a guy who's the Fed guy. You should talk to him. I was referred to somebody from a family member. He was retired military who had gone to the private sector and now was coming into federal service. And of course, when you leave private sector, those benefits stop. So that was the first thing we were planning through. So for example, his life insurance benefit with his employer was, was ending. And I said, all right, so you're coming in. You have your enrollment forms. You want to sign up for maximum coverage under FEGLI, the Federal Employee Group Life Insurance. And that way it'll match up with what you had before. If there's something out there that we find that might be better for you, you can always change it later. But first things first, let's get that coverage. And we had a checklist to go through and we were going to connect back again in a month or so. So he came back in, we're going through the checklist and I said, okay, so you took care of your insurance, right? And he goes, I think so. Hmm. And I said, what do you mean you think so? He said, well, I turned the paperwork in, but there haven't been any deductions yet. And this was now approaching the two month mark. And I said, okay, but you did turn it in. He goes, yep. I said, all right, do not return a phone call when you get back. Do not answer the phone when you get back. Do not open an email. Contact your personnel, find out what's happening, and get back to me. And when he did, he said, Dan, it's bad news. I, I did turn it in, but it never got started, and now it's too late. And I knew he was a military man, 
So I knew he was used to carrying his records with him. So I said, come back in, bring your files. And it didn't take too long going through the files before we found a, a signed, dated, received copy of the paperwork he had turned in. So I said, okay, there's good news and bad news. Good news is you're in the program. Bad news is they're going to deduct a whole lot of premiums in a short period of time. Didn't think that much about it. A little less than two years ago, he died suddenly. <laughs> okay, a little less than two years after we did that. And when my, my assistant came in, walked into the door and told me, it just stunned me because I had been fixing these little things along the way for people for so many years, but nothing had ever happened. And in this particular case, I knew that I had done something that made a difference. And when I got home that night and I talked to my wife, I told her about it. And so this was a sizable insurance amount that would now be made available to his widow that wasn't going to be there. And I said, you know, um, I think, I think your dad would have been, would have been proud of me today because, because of what I learned that I couldn't do for him. I, I got the chance to fix something. Nice. So, yeah. Well, you have the attention of a lot of people, uh, who should listen to the podcast and what is the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, if you're a career fed, uh, family of a career fed, friend of a career fed, um, if you're somebody who might be contemplating a decision for another shutdown, you should definitely listen to this one over and over again. Um, but, you know, I would say anybody in uh, anybody in federal service and especially if you if you want to get a better understanding of your benefits no pressure environment if you want understanding made easy. And you can reach us on the web. It's www.stwserve.com. You can find us on Facebook as well. Watch out for our seminars. But if you're out there, if you've been looking for answers and you've been frustrated about where you can find them, you're going to find them here. And if that's all you want, that's fine. Just remember this. Shake our hand. Tell your friends we did it right. Well, Dan, thank you very much for allowing us to uh, get to know you even better today. And thank you, Matt. It was fun. All right. So make sure uh, if you do know somebody who needs to hear this, share this podcast with uh, your friends and family, especially anybody who does happen to be a career federal employee. And if you are <clears throat> wanting to know more about what is going on with your federal benefits, please, please sign up for one of the seminars because they're magnificent. They're wildly educational, and you might even have a little bit of a good time. So for everybody at Serving Those Who Serve, this is Matt Halloran, and we'll see and you on Dan the other side. And Dan Sype, and we'll both see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services.